Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this very special virtual seminar of the SIB. Today, it's going to be a celebration of the SIB Fellowship Program and the students that have graduated last year in 2017. So the presentations will be from the Ron Apple, the SIB director, executive director of the SIB, and the four students that, the, that Ron is going to, to introduce you during his presentation. So we are going to keep this, so this is a very special seminar with many people presenting at the time. We are going to keep all the questions for the end. So those that are on uh, listening from, to us from, from the streaming, they can ask the questions through the chat box of the Adobe and we will repeat the questions for the presenters afterwards. So thank you very much for all and enjoy the presentations. Ron Apple, please. Thank you, Patricia. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you at this celebration of the first promotion of the SIB. Uh, welcome to all of you in the room and welcome to the many thousand people online. Something like that. Uh, several thousand. Okay. So as you can see from the title of my short introduction, uh, it's about research and it's about people. At SIB, uh, our mission is mainly threefold. On the one hand, we have the goal to provide infrastructure and resources to the life science community worldwide. Then we provide training and eventually third aspect, we try to promote research. And today, as you have already understood, it's about promoting research and to do good research in bioinformatics or the informat bioinformatics part in life science, what do you need? You need well-trained, outstanding bioinformaticians. And this is why we decided a few years ago to create the SIB fellowship program. And so the goal of the SIB fellowship program in order to promote better research, even better research in Switzerland was to attract outstanding students to Switzerland and provide them with a grant so that they can do a PhD in three years, exceptionally with an additional year. And the outstanding students who were uh, selected could, in this way, carry out a research project in three or four years under the supervision of uh, PI of one of the universities being uh, an SIB group leader. So they were supervised by an SIB group leader. At the same time, the PhD would take place at one of the Swiss universities, one of the SIB partner universities. Of course, each of these universities are institutional members of the SIB. In addition to that, these selected students would be during the whole time of their PhD, of their PhD, they were or are SIB members, and they are also part of our uh, SIB of our Swiss bioinformatics PhD student training network. So the first step was to select the students. We published a call. We actually published two calls. One in 2012 for a selection taking place early 2013 for PhDs work starting in 2013 and the second call 2014 to start in 2015. So in the first call, we published it quite wide. We had more than 100 applications from more than 30 different countries all over the world. From the file, from the application, we selected 18 um, 18 applicants whom we invited to Switzerland for the uh, two days um, selection process. And out of these, we selected six uh, students for the fellowship. And then two years later, we did the same again, and we had actually similar figures. We had more than 100 applications. 
from as many countries and we selected 18 who were invited and then selected only four. We had only four grants available. And SIB is funded in part by the federal government, but not for research. We are funded for the other two missions, providing infrastructure, providing resources, uh, developing tools, developing databases, part of training, but we are not funded for research, so we need it to be able to carry out this fellowship program. We needed sponsors, and we were quite lucky to find a number of sponsors, systemtix.ch, which funded two uh, PhD students, the Fondation Lennart in the Arc Lémanique, the universities of Geneva, Zurich, and uh, Lausanne, and then the Geige Stiftung and the foundation with a very long name, Swiss Foundation for Excellence on Talent in Biomedical Research. So we are indebted uh, to these sponsors which allowed us to launch this fellowship program. And today we are celebrating the first promotion of our fellowship program and more precisely we will celebrate all together the first four PhD students who finished their PhD. So very briefly I finished by introducing each of them in the order they are going to present their talk. The first one is Yannick Holmer who did his PhD within this program under the supervision of Dagmar Iber at the ETH funded uh, by the systemzix.ch grant. Yannick joined the SIB coming from the University of Stuttgart. The second one is Franziska Gruhl, who came from the University of Heidelberg, did her PhD in Lausanne under the joint supervision of Henrik Kessmann and Johannes Xenarios. Then we have Malgorzata Novitska. When I tested the, the, sorry about that, when I tested the presentation, there was a very nice picture of you, so, but we'll see you in, in, in 15, no, not at all. So you did your PhD under the supervision of Mark Robinson at the University of Zurich, with a grant from the University of Zurich, and eventually, and you came, sorry, from Poland, you did your master's at the Polytechnic of Breslau. And eventually, Gabriel Studer doing his PhD with Thorsten Schwede in Basel. And he already did his master in Basel, if I'm correct. So, so far for the short introduction. Uh, again, uh, I would like to thank first our sponsors for their generous support, then our fellows, first for being here today and doing this presentation, but also for the Nice work that you have done, and all of you who are here to celebrate with us. So, enjoy the talk. All right, thanks a lot for the nice introduction. <coughs> and thanks to the SIB for organizing this nice event here today. Um, as said, I did my PhD under the supervision of Dagmar Eber at the DBSSC of ETH Zurich. And during my PhD, I focused on the question of growth control in organ development with a particular focus of its analysis in Drosophila and also a bit of vertebrates, as you will see later on. So what is growth control? Well, in growth control, we try to answer the question of what determines the final size of an organ. Just think about your two arms. They're perfectly the same length. They're in proportion to the rest of your body. So clearly, there need to be robust mechanisms in place that ensure uh, growth termination at the right size. What do we know about growth termination or growth control? Well, on the one hand, we have organ extrinsic control. As I said, your organs scale with your body size. And clearly, body and organ size are influenced by external factors, such as, for example, nutrition. On the other hand, however, we have also something called organ intrinsic control. To explain this idea, take this experiment done over 80 years ago by Twitty and Schwinn. There, they transplanted the developing limbs from a smaller newt species to a bigger one and vice versa. And what they observed is, as you can see um, on the picture, is that these grafted limbs grew not to their host size, but to their donor size, clearly indicating an organ intrinsic mechanism of growth control here. Now, due to the shortness of the talk, um, I cannot go into details of previous models that have been published, but let me just say that there are other models, of course, um, but a lot of them are controversial or have failed. <clears throat> so my PhD focused on the question of organ intrinsic growth control, 
And when I started my PhD, the question was, well, wouldn't cell differentiation, so going from a highly to a less proliferative cell state in a deterministic manner be um, sufficient to terminate growth robustly? We studied this question in the development of the eye in the Drosophila fruit fly, and the eye, as any other organ in, develop, in, in Drosophila, develops from an imaginal disk. Here you can see the antenna eye imaginal disk. The parts indicated um, as indicated form the antenna as well as the eye. Now, growth of the eye part is quite particular because the cells anterior, so if you look on the screen to the left of the morphogenetic furrow, um, are contributing the growth, are proliferating, while the cells to the right are actually uh, differentiated cells. So there's a clear spatial separation between them. Now, this boundary, this morphogenetic furrow, is not stationary, but as development progressive, progresses, it sweeps um, in a posterior to anterior, so right to left manner over the tissue. This final size of this organ is thereby determined how fast the cells or the tissue grows in the anterior part and how fast this boundary moves over the tissue. We started to look in this. Of course, first we need to acquire data. We used um, 3D imaging and then image reconstruction to give us the total area shown in red as well as the anterior and posterior areas. Also, we measured what is in the, shown in orange, the posterior length. And that's the distance that this furrow has moved up to this time point, And this is linearly related to time. We then, of course, can start to explore the data. There are two interesting properties in the data. First, the total area shown on the left expands about linearly with developmental time. And on the right, you see that when you plot the anterior proliferative part versus the posterior differentiative part, um, you see this um, bell shaped curve with the fast initial increase, which then settles off and eventually will decay again. So the question now is, are these growth dynamics really just the result of this moving furrow, or do we need additional mechanisms that allow the furrow to catch up and eventually terminate growth? To answer this question, we could write this simple model where the change in the total area over the developmental time is, of course, equal to the changes in the anterior and posterior part. And that's then equal to what we call the area growth rate k times the anterior area. Now we are interested in, or we were interested in, what um, is this anti what is this, sorry, what is this growth rate k um, over time? Well, we cannot measure k, but we can infer it from our data. To do so, we can approximate the slope in this plot and then simply divide the respective slope by the anterior area. And when we, we did this, you immediately see that there is a continuous decline in this growth rate k, so suggesting that there is an additional mechanism that downregulates the growth rate in this anterior part of the tissue and allowing the morphogenetic furrow to catch up and eventually terminate growth. So this is already interesting for us, but of course we were wondering, well, can we also find functions that describe this decline and eventually link these functions and also to biological mechanisms? We found um, three different functions, so a power law relationship, an area-dependent growth law where the growth rate k is inversely proportional to the total area t, and an exponential growth law. Now, unfortunately, the first case, we couldn't find any corresponding biological mechanism. The second case would correspond to a case where a growth controlling factor is getting diluted. And finally, the exponential case would correspond to a, a, a growth controlling factor being degraded. We then went on to simulate, simulate the growth of this tissue and um, use these different growth models. And when we did this, this is what we got. Now the different colored lines are the different models with a declining growth rate. In gray, you see, can also see what would happen if we had a constant growth rate and you immediately see that we would not be able to, or that we are not able to reproduce the growth data with this model. Now coming back to the colored lines, what you, all, what you see is that all of them fit the data nicely, but all of them, or the differences between them, are very subtle. So clearly, it's not possible to say one model here is better than any of the others. However, there's one interesting property of these imaginal disks, and that is that you can dissect them out of the developing larvae and transplant them into the abdomen of adult flies. And what will happen is that they will still grow to approximately the same size, but development will take five to seven-fold longer. So here's such data. On the left, it's our control larvae wild type um, data. And on the right, it's data for such grafted items. Now, interestingly, 
the area dependent growth rate, which would correspond to a dilution based mechanism, um, naturally preserves the final size and also the growth kinetics at these lower developmental points. So we thought, well, this would be a very elegant model. And in a follow up study to this first part, then looked whether we can actually identify uh, a biological molecule that could regulate growth in such a manner. And indeed, we found unpaired or UPD. Its production is restricted to the initial stages of eye development, so it's being diluted during the main phase of outgrowth. And as you can see here, it has a, a massive influence on the final eye size when it's um, down or up regulated. Now, we did a <coughs> genetic screen for different mutants in this pathway and then checking the final eye sizes in the adult flies. Just want to highlight a few of these genotypes here. So, the black genotype that's a control strain, and all the previous analysis has been based on this strain. The blue genotype is another control strain with very similar eye size. The yellow genotype, there we downregulate UPD signaling, we get much smaller eyes. And in the red case, we upregulate UPD signaling and we get much bigger eyes. We then went on to do the same or similar analysis as before. So we acquired the growth data. Nothing too surprising here, but then um, more interestingly, went on to again approximate the growth rate K in these different genotypes. So here's again this dilution-based or area-dependent model where we have an inverse relationship between K, the growth rate, and the total area T. And we have a slope of minus one, um, so this direct inverse relationship. Now in case of the blue genotype, as I said, it's another control case, so we would expect, again, a slope of minus one and similar growth rates, and that's indeed what we observe. In case of the yellow genotype, we reduce the initial levels of UPD, we get smaller eyes, so we would still expect a slope of minus one, but substantially lower growth rates, and again, that's what we observe. Now finally, in the red case, we continuously express UPD now also during the phase that it has been previously only um, been diluted, and we would therefore expect that we now have a slope that is bigger than minus one, and that's indeed what we observe. Now finally, we wondered whether such declining growth rates could be something that's evolutionary conserved also in other organs. And we therefore checked <clears throat> also these other organs. Now I just want to show one example here. So that's a developing limb bud of mice. We again measured different properties of this um, development. And we again found that we need to use declining growth rates to fit this data. And more importantly, or very interestingly, found that we can use similar or even the same growth models to describe this decline. Now, in case of the limb bud, we also had the possibility to actually check the proliferation rates directly and again found that there's a decline. With this, I would like to conclude. I've shown you very briefly that in, during my PhD, <coughs> I observed in declining growth rates in organ development independent of the organism studied. And more specifically, I've shown you that in the itis, the area growth rate declines inversely proportional to the area growth and that dilution of UPD quantitatively explains eye development of several mutants. Now, there have been, of course, a lot of people involved in these projects along the way. I want to thank especially my supervisor, Professor Dagmar Eber, as well as Professor Fernando Casares and his whole team for the nice col collaboration on the Drosophila project. And then, of course, I want to thank SIB and Systems X for the generous funding of my PhD. Thank you. Um, so I would like to thank the organizers for presentation and to, to be able to present here. My PhD project, uh, project, which is entitled Recently Active Transportable Elements, provides insights into the evolution of mammalian cell flowering. The transcriptional landscape of a cell is diverse. There are many different RNAs, such as protein coding mRNAs, long non coding RNAs, different small RNAs, and since recently the landscape was further expanded by the discovery of circular RNAs. Circular RNAs distinguish themselves from a normal linear transcript by their unusual splicing behavior. In a normal splicing reaction, the 3 prime end of an exon is joined to the 5 prime end of an exon that is located downstream on the gene. In contrast, circular RNAs are formed by a so-called back-splicing reaction, in which the 3 prime end is spliced to an exon that is located upstream in the gene, leading to the observed circular structure. As of today, there is very little known about circular RNAs. It is evident that they are present in a wide range of species, tissues, and develop developmental time frames. They often overlap with protein coding genes, and they are very, very stable due to their circular structure, but possess very low expression levels. There is some evidence that 
The backsplicing reaction is supported by repetitive sequences in the flanking regions. These repetitive sequences can base break to each other, forming a hairpin-like structure in which the two axons that are involved in the splicing reaction are brought in closer proximity, which facilitates the whole reaction. Interestingly, they are often found in neuronal tissues, and the axons involved in circular RNAs are associated with high activation scores. Currently, it is hypothesized that they might be involved in a variety of different processes, such as microRNA sponging or transcriptional control. But we only have a handful of functional examples, which makes it very, very difficult to extrapolate on their functional importance. Nevertheless, the high number of circular RNAs, their presence across different species, and their sequence conservation is often used as a claim for their functional importance. However, none of the current studies was specifically designed to address the question of functional importance based on evolutionary conservation. We therefore decided to readdress this hypothesis in my PhD project. I've been working with a data set that consists of five different species, the opossum, mouse, rat, rhesus macaque, and human. In addition, I looked at three different organs, the liver, cerebellum, and testicles. In collaboration with the lab of David Getfield from the University of Lausanne, we generated keratin sequencing data, and I developed a detection pipeline to predict and to identify circular RNAs across all the different species and tissues. When I apply this detection pipeline to my samples, I'm able to uh, identify about two to 3,000 circular RNAs per species. In the next step, I try to assess the overlap of circular RNAs between different species based on the exact splice set. I was able to identify a small number, about 100 circular RNAs, that are shared between all the species. This number is higher than expected. Nevertheless, we can also see that the number of species-specific circular RNAs is at least a magnitude higher. In addition to this, I was also able to show that the expression levels show kind of intermediate conservation levels. And similar to what was reported in the literature, circular RNA exons possess higher FASMAC scores. As I just showed you, some circular RNAs are shared between species, but does this necessarily mean that they are conserved? In order to address this question, we need to understand that there are two alternative hypotheses that can explain the observed overlap. In the case of divergent evolution, we have a phenotypic trait in species A and B, and this phenotypic trait developed from a common ancestor. So this trait is conserved. In case of circular RNAs, that means if we have a circular RNA in species A and B, there was already in the common ancestor of these two species a circular RNA present. But sometimes similar environmental conditions can also lead to the development of similar phenotypes by a process known as parallel evolution. In that case, we have a phenotypic trait in species A and B, but it originated independently and there was no common ancestor. For circular RNAs, that means even though we have circular RNAs in species A and B, they did not originate from a common ancestor, but maybe because of similar genomic constraints. I therefore was wondering if there are indeed such genomic properties that can maybe explain the presence of circular RNAs. And in order to address this question, I used different linear regression models. The idea here is that we have a response variable that can be the presence and absence of a circular RNA parental gene, how many circular RNAs are present in a gene, or whether circular RNAs are shared or species-specific. We then use a set of different predictors to understand how they contribute to the probability of observing this response variable. In my case, the set of predictors consisted of, for example, the genomic length of the gene in which the circular RNA is found, the number of exons and transcripts, the GC content, the complementarity within the gene or the number of observed repeats, and a couple of other predictors. When I apply these linear regression models to my circular RNA dataset, then it becomes very evident that there is indeed a set of several genomic properties that predict circular RNA presence. These properties are a very strong decrease in GC content, an increased genomic length, higher fast scores, and self-complementarity in the gene. And these properties are true for all of the species analyzed. In addition, these genomic properties do not only predict the presence of circular RNAs, but they can also indicate the number of circular RNAs per gene and their presence in other species. Furthermore, I've seen 
that the complementary of the intron and the number of repetitive sequences seems to also play an important role and influences whether SOFRAN is present or not. And I therefore decided to analyze these repetitive sequences in more detail. Circular RNA flanking introns are repeat rich. What we can see here is the mean repeat frequency of um, flanking and background introns in all the different species. And as you can see, the purple bars, which represent flanking introns, are at least twofold higher, possess at least two times more repetitive sequences than the background introns. In all species, these repetitive sequences do also overlap with small transposable elements. And when we analyze the small transposable elements in more detail, then we can see that these TEs are very often lineage or species specific, as in the example of human that I'm showing you here. So in purple, we have those TEs that are enriched in the flanking introns. And interestingly, they are primate or human specific. They all belong to the class of allo elements. In contrast, we also have a couple of repeats or TEs that are decreased in the frequency. And what we can see here is that, for example, all the near elements that are mammalian specific TEs, so present across all mammals, are degraded in these introns. There are additional associations, such as that the enriched TEs were recently active, so they are young. Because they were recently active, they have lower degradation levels, and they have the potential to form stable secondary structures, not only with the exact same TE uh, class, but also with other family members. Interestingly, shared circular RNAs are also enriched in lineage and species-specific TEs, contrarily to what we would expect if they are shared. From the literature, we also know that TEs can interfere with the splicing reaction of a gene and cause splicing error. And therefore, hypothesizing the following model to explain why circular RNAs are present across different species. The idea is that we have orthologous parameter genes that are found in a similar genomic context. Because the genomic context is similar, it leads to the species-specific integration or independent integration of lineage-specific transposable elements into the circular RNA parental genes. And because these integrations were recently and the TEs are young, they can still base pair very strongly in order to form the hairpin-like structure that supports circular RNA formation. So it means that the presence of circular RNAs in different species and tissues is not explained by their functional significance and high conservation levels, but instead by a similar genomic context in which the orthologous parental genes are found. The, present, or the presence of recently active and lineage-specific transposable elements suggests, therefore, that circular RNAs originated independently from each other and that many circular RNAs might rather be a splicing error than a functional product. And with this conclusion, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would like to thank you, my supervisors, Henry Kessman and Johannes Scenarius, as well as all the other people that have been involved in the project and the different funding resources. Thank you. Well, thank you for organizing this very nice event. Uh, to uh, have opportunity ref to refresh my PhD team, <laughs> with, which has a long title, but uh, in short, it was mainly about differential analysis, uh, which were answering questions, various biological questions, and also were dedicated to analyze various types of high throughput data. I uh, will talk briefly about my two main projects. One of them was to develop a package, which is called DreamSeq. Uh, this package you can use for differential transcript visit analysis from RNA-seq data. And the other work is a site of workflow which describes a differential analysis approach to site of data. Both of them are available on Bioconductor, uh, so you can, you can go there and see them. So the key features of the DreamSeq package is that it can be applied to differential transcript visit analysis and the transcript visit PCL analysis. It is based on a Dirichlet multinomial model. So this is the information for statisticians. Uh, which is an over-dispersed uh, model for um, uh, proportions uh, in comparison to multinomial uh, distribution. Uh, it, it was designed to perform inference in small sample size data, and with it you, can, uh, you are able to model complex experimental designs, which can account, for example, for bad effects that you have in your, in your design. And uh, here in the corner, this is a sticker that uh, 
comes along with the package, so Mark has some of them. If you're interested <laughs> to put it on your laptop or somewhere, you, 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 can, you, can, you can get it. Uh, so now I will move to the site of workflow. So the site of technology is used to measure protein uh, expression on, on, on single cells. In this experiment, uh, for each cell, uh, proteins of interest are, are tagged with metal isotopes, which are attached to the protein-specific antibodies. Such tagged cells go to the mass cytometer, which does magic and measures the metal isotopes abundance on each cell. As a consequence, we get a table uh, of, uh, of this metal abundance for each single cell. And the site, in the site of workflow, we describe how to perform differential analysis using this data. We refer to this approach as a classical. Uh, it consists of two steps. In, uh, in the first step, we identify the cell populations present in the data. For that, we use some unsupervised clustering approaches. In the second step, we use statistical modeling and testing to find out which cell populations are differentially abundant between the conditions of interest. In our workflow, we use a demonstration data which comes from a Bodemiller study where the Tarifella blood mononuclear cells were investigated. And here we want to compare uh, samples from eight patients in two conditions, before and after stimulation. Uh, in this experiment, 10 cell surface markers and 14 signaling markers were measured, but only the 10 surface markers are used to identify the cell types. So the first step is to cluster cells into groups uh, of similar cells. Here I show you results of clustering into 20 groups. On the left side, this is a heat map that shows the median marker expression of these 10 uh, uh, markers in each of the 20 clusters uh, marked by barcode on the, on the left. On the right side, you can see a result of dimension reduction technique where here now each cell is shown into two dimensions. We, uh, we have used here a method called TSM. It's a very popular method for this sort of analysis. So we can also see that in this TSM map, uh, the, cells, the cells are colored according to the cluster that they belong to. So, and we can see that uh, cells that belong to similar clusters are really closer to each other. In the next step, an expert, uh, my colleague, uh, was annotating this, uh, this identified clusters into meaningful cell populations. In case when some of the clusters were having similar, uh, similar protein expression, it can be that they were annotated as uh, the same cluster. And uh, here, as a consequence, we obtained eight main cell types for the PBMC, uh, for, from the PBMC. Now, we are interested in the uh, differences in the abundance of these cell types between the two conditions. So here, for example, we can already see that the dark blue cells, which correspond to the CD4 cells, are less abundant in the uh, uh, simulated condition on the right than in the reference. But in particular, we are interested in the proportions in comparison of the proportions at which cell types are present in the sample. So it, here, but here, uh, here, each bar uh, presents the uh, composition of the of the sample with with the corresponding L eight cell types. And in our method, we concentrate at each single cell type at once. Uh, here, I show you uh, an example of the analysis for the CD4 cells. And on the right side, you can see uh, the same proportions, but visualized using box plots. And hopefully, you can also see that uh, this visualization already shows much better that what are the potential differences in between the conditions. Uh, we use the generalized linear mixed models. 
and we assume that the cell count followed by binomial distribution and the log it of proportions of these cells can be explained by a linear combination of an intercept uh, and a component that explains the differences between the two conditions the uh, observational level random effect that accounts for the extra over dispersion in the data and a random intercept for each patient which explains the blocking between patients which are highlighted here by the circles. Actually this workflow originally was developed uh, during the analysis that I performed in a collaboration with my colleague Karsten Krieg. Uh, here the goal was to identify biomarkers that are associated with the response to anti-PD-1 immunotherapy. We were studying the P, uh, PBMC, uh, PBMC in healthy donor and melanoma patients that were undergoing anti-PD-1 immunotherapy. Those patients after the therapy were then classified into responders and non-responders. And the goal was to compare what are the differences between responders and non-responders, the green and the red patients. Additional challenge in here was that the data was acquired in few measure, measurement batches, but luckily, thanks to the GLM uh, approach, we could account for that in our modeling. So the main results from this, uh, from this analysis are now coming in the next slide. So first, we were uh, interested in the general characterization of the lymphocyte. Here is a CISNI map showing, that, uh, showing the cell identified cell type. We have identified seven ma main cell types. And among them, CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells were downregulated in, uh, in, in responders versus non-responders. And for the myeloid cells, we could observe an inverse uh, association, where there is higher proportion of those cells in responders than in non-responders. In the next step, we are also interested in better, uh, in more in-depth characterization of the myeloid cells. And for that, a different panel of proteins was uh, measured for uh, again, and here, we were able to stratify the myeloid cells into CD14 negative and CD14 positive cells. From the differential analysis in here, we could find out again, we could confirm again that the T cells are less abundant in responders than in non-responders. And actually among the myeloid cells, it's only the CD14 cells that are uh, in higher abundance in responders. And those CD14 cells are also referred as to classical monocytes. We could validate this result using an independent cohort of patients and a fax experiment. Here the same trend is, is shown. And we could also find a significant association of better clinical outcome for patients with higher frequency of monocytes. So with that, I would like to thank my supervisor, Mark, for great supervision through these four years, uh, other committee members, uh, my collaborators, SI, of course, SIV, and uh, the Robinson Group, and again, Mark. <laughs> Thanks again. Uh, it's the last time now for organizing this event. And I want to present you the work I did through my PhD at the, with the title Efficient Algorithms in Protein Modeling. And I want to start with throwing a number into the room. So it's 20 years of the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. So the project that the opportunity to work, uh, opportunity to work on is tightly connected to the SIP, but is around for even longer. So it all started with a paper from 1993 by Manuel Peitsch. And what emerged out of it is the Swiss model web server that is still around today. When you open the website, you see a few sentences that describe what it is, and here in bold, I highlight, uh, highlighted the actual philosophy behind. So it's the purpose of the service to make protein modeling accessible to all biochemists and molecular biologists worldwide. Well, to answer the question why protein modeling is necessary, we have to appreciate a little bit the functional complexity of proteins. This goes a little bit beyond just complex metabolic networks as it is highlighted here uh, on this slide, but it also involves signaling events, uh, cellular transport. I mean, proteins are even um, building blocks for cytoskeleton. 
but what ultimately determines function is structure. Well, so this means when we want to understand the mechanistic effect of a disease mutation, we need to know structure, or in our case, maybe a model can inform about the question at hand. This is shown here with the example of a gamma hydroxybutyrate dehydrogenase, short GHBD, which we built for an ongoing project in our group. Well, but when we come back to actual structural information, we have a problem, and that's the problem. The problem is here, this blue line, it shows a number of entries in the Tremble database, and the, the growth here uh, represents the explosion of the sequence methodologies we observed in uh, recent years. And what you would see in the red line is uh, the number of entries in SwissProt, which is also a project here at the SIP. And it's a manually curated subset of Tremble. And in green, you would see the number of entries that we have in the PDB. So it's the number of micromolecular complexes where we have actual structural data. Now to make red and green visible, we have to look at the same thing at logarithmic scale. And uh, what becomes obvious is this huge structural gap. So it's a number of sequences where we have uh, actually no idea how it looks like. And that's exactly the goal of Swiss model, to reduce the size of this gap and inform the scientists of what could going on. Now, uh, this is all based on a statement that has been made in the 80s by Arthur Lask and Sarah Scafia but it claimed that if two proteins are homologous, their um, structure can expect to be very similar. So this still holds today, and I just illustrated here with three uh, homologs to GHBD, and the bottom right you see a pairwise sequence identity matrix. So this means uh, these numbers represent the percentage of identical amino acids when you do a pairwise sequence alignment. So despite the moderate homology, the three-dimensional similarity is absolutely stunning. And that's exactly the starting point for homology modeling. So it all starts with a pairwise sequence alignment. You have a template, you have a target. And this uh, sequence alignment also um, reflects evolutionary events that happen. So you have insertions here marked with red. You have deletions marked with green. And the first step of uh, homology modeling typically is you have to resolve these evolutionary events to, um, to construct the wellest backbone. So you do that by uh, sampling the conformational space that is available for such a stretch. So you need algorithms that do that. You need algorithms to finally decide for one particular conformation. And for performance reasons, you typically don't do that in a full atomistic representation, but rather reduce reduced representations of the protein structure. So this is why we then need algorithms that um, subsequently explore the conformational space that is available to all the sidechain atoms and finally decide which is the optimal configuration. By doing all these steps, you introduce uh, very chemical irregularities. There is nothing you can do about it. And, but you can typically nicely resolve them, them by applying energy min minimization using molecular mechanics force field. Now on this slide, uh, this slide pretty much summarizes the main project of my thesis. So it was all about exploring, investigating current state-of-the-art algorithms in homology modeling, implement novelties, and push the current state-of-the-art, push what is possible. And what came out of it is the PROMA3 modeling engine. So it's a full software package that does the full homology modeling from, from A to Z. It has a modeler design and is written in highly efficient C++ code. And the clue with it is all the functionality is exported to the Python scripting language. So it's also promised for the future because you can easily prototype new algorithms on top of it. But when I now talk of uh, pushing the current state of the art, uh, I also need to provide a little bit numbers so that you believe me. Um, so the obvious thing to do is to compare with what most people use. And in this case, this is modeler. Even though it's a relatively old software package, that's what the people are using. And uh, what I did here to generate this um, illustration here is um, I uh, obtained a few hundred models. I built them in parallel with exactly the same input in Modeler with Proma 3. And I, and I plotted a histogram of differences in score. So in red, you see uh, the so-called LDDP score, which is a metric that uh, describes the similarity of a protein structure to a known target. Higher is better. When you now take the difference, you see that uh, the red distribution is clearly shifted to the right. So models generated with PROMA3 are more accurate. On the other hand, with 
full in blue, we have the mold property score that is agnostic of the target structure, but the rather evaluates uh, valid stereochemistry. chemistry. And in this case, lower is better, and again, from a three seems to produce better models. Now, uh, what to summarize this plot, we can say that despite the runtime of PROMAP3 to generate one model is lower than with modeler, the models are more accurate in stereochemical modality. Um, to close the loop a little bit to the introduction, uh, we have a look at Swiss model. Now it looks like today, 25 years after kickoff. And I uh, can proudly say that uh, since about one and a half years, uh, it is powered by the PROMA3 modeling engine. And since uh, we have about two requests per minute, this makes already a few thousand uh, or many thousand protein models that have been built for the scientific community worldwide. But that's not all. Um, you cannot just throw three-dimensional coordinates to a user. I mean, a typical question that comes up is uh, how accurate is my model? So how, how similar to the actual target structure can I expect it to be? So this was the second question I followed a little bit in my PhD thesis, and there I was involved in two projects. It's all about uh, the so-called quality estimation problem, and I asked him in a bit the more specific question. The question was rather, where is my model good? Where is my model bad? So it was all about per residue local quality estimate. So one project that was involved in was uh, uh, estimating local qualities uh, with a scoring function that appreciates the physicomical properties that occur in transmembrane protein models. And then another project uh, was together with, uh, in collaboration with a master's student, Christine Remper, where we um, assessed the consistency of interatomic distances in protein models with ensembles of constraints uh, that we extracted from all homologs that we find for a particular target. Now, that was a summary. So it's, uh, yeah, by the way, this is all available also from the Swiss model website. And this was the summary of what I did. So it's time to wrap up. And I can say that uh, this thesis had an impact on quality estimation in protein models and further pushed the philosophy of Swiss model in making protein modeling accessible to all biochemistry molecular biologists worldwide. And say to, it's time to say thank you. So thank you, SIP, for organizing this fellowship program. And even a PhD student needs something to eat. So also funding is very important. And in my case, this was the Swiss Foundation for Excellence in Talent in Biomedical Research. And I also want to thank Torsen uh, for a great working environment at the Biazentrum in Basel. And the other p uh, two people you see there is uh, Tim Meyer uh, from the Biazentrum and Matteo Dalperaro from ETFL, who were my PhD committee. This also wouldn't have been possible without SciCor, the Center of Scientific Computing. And there are so many names that I need to say thank you. So this should represent that, but just drop a few. There is all the people from the group, like, I don't know, Gerardo Tavriello, Stefan Wiener, and so on and so on. So, and also, thank you for listening.